So if we could begin to find our seats, we can begin the session to leave more time for questions at the end. Uh, it's my privilege today, a, a true privilege. My name is John Paul Kimes. I am the Raymond of Pinafort uh, Fellow in Canon Law of the Center for Ethics and Culture. Uh, my day job is that I work at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome uh, as a canon lawyer. I could not be more geeked out right now than <laughs> to be between two living giants of the law. So anyone who has a love of the law today, you ought to be in serious fan zone as I am. And I want to begin by introducing Professor Marianne Glendon, whom I had the great privilege of studying with uh, some years ago in Rome. She is the Learned Hand Professor of Law at Harvard University, former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, a permanent senior distinguished research fellow of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. She writes and teaches in the fields of human rights, comparative law, constitutional law, political theory, and probably a thousand other things that we don't have time to name right now. Professor Glendon is also a member of the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, which she has served, she served as president for over 10 years. And she's also a member of the International Academy of Comparative Law. Her books include The Forum and The Tower, A World Made New, Eleanor Roosevelt and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, A Nation Under Lawyers, and Rights Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to present this morning our first speaker, Professor Marianne Glendon. Thank you, Father Kimes. And a very good student you were oh, back yeah. then in Rome, too. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here and to be on the panel with Patrizia. I'm looking forward to our conversations. Uh, I have to confess that it's with some trepidation that I'm broaching the subject of human rights here in the university where a very famous philosopher who spoke here the other day uh, likened faith in human rights to belief in unicorns and witches. Uh, so. I, but I would like to think that even Professor McIntyre would agree with some of the concerns that I'm going to express today. Uh, when I go to a lecture, I always want to know why the speaker chose a particular topic. And uh, the reason for my raising the question, can the Human Rights Project be saved, is due to the unusual circumstances that surround the upcoming anniversary, the 70th anniversary, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Next month, on December 10, to be precise, there will be celebrations at the United Nations of the document that became the most prominent symbol of the yes. post-World War II Human Rights Project. And there will be speakers from many countries who will celebrate the document and they will recall as on previous 10-year anniversaries, they will recall the successes to which the Human Rights Project contributed. The demise of colonialism, the fall of apartheid in South Africa, and the nonviolent overthrow of the totalitarian regimes, the seemingly indestructible totalitarian regimes in Eastern Europe. But unlike on past universities, uh, anniversaries. This year, there will be, I predict, a sober, a more sober mood in those celebrations. And that is due to the fact that there is a rising tide of skepticism about the very idea of human rights. Uh, skepticism, of course, that was expressed long ago by Alistair McIntyre, but today has become quite intense, even among people who at one time professed themselves to be great supporters of human rights. So here on the screen is a little sampling, just a small sampling of the current literature. Aaron Rhodes, a longtime human rights activist, now says, and I quote, the movement to which I devoted most of my life has lost its essential meaning and moral power, end quote. Stephen Hopgood, uh, international law expert, says that we're living in the end times of human rights. And even the editor of First Things, Rusty Reno, says now that he's against human rights, even though on the 50th anniversary, 
the magazine warmly praised the Universal Declaration in a statement to which Professor Karatza and I contributed a bit. Um, skepticism, why? One might wonder, why now? Why, what, why has an idea that once had such unifying force, such galvanize, galvanizing force, why has that idea fallen into so much disrepute? Why is it losing support, both in the liberal democracies and in developing countries? And what, if anything, could be done to rehabilitate it? And is it worth saving, or should it be relegated to the dustbin along with witches and unicorns? Those are the three questions I propose to touch on briefly in this talk. So let me begin with why support is declining. As I see it, there were two stages in which good intentions, honest mistakes, power politics, and plain old opportunism were all involved. First, there was a selective attitude toward rights initiated way back in 1948 by what were then the two superpowers. The ink was barely dry on the Universal Declaration when the United States and the Soviet Union, so to speak, tore the document in half with the United States championing the political and civil rights in the first part of the Declaration and the Soviet Union championing the social and economic provisions in the second part of the Declaration. And to tell the truth, the two superpowers were among the least enthusiastic nations in the then 58-member UN uh, because they had special concerns about their sovereignty. Uh, it was the smaller nations who were more enthusiastic. But by pulling apart what was constructed to be an integrated holistic document, the two superpowers set the stage for a good deal of mischief further on, which brings me to stage two. Once the Human Rights Project showed its real moral force in the events of the late 1980s and the early 1990s, its influence increased dramatically. Countless new human, human rights organizations sprang up with countless experts, uh, activists, journals, centers, agencies for monitoring and enforcement, and those changes in the scale of the human rights movement were accompanied by significant changes in ambition. So, human rights organizations, the established ones, they didn't say, mission accomplished, close the door and we'll go home. They started looking around for new causes. And many special interest groups, seeing the effect uh, that the movement had had, sought to have their agenda items characterized as universal human rights. And of course, the wishes of the funders of these bodies had to be considered. Among the most active NGOs in the UN settings and in other international settings were advocates for abortion rights. Already at the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995, then First Lady Hillary Clinton famously launched the slogan, human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. Now that statement is actually half true. <laughs> Human rights are women's rights. Human rights belong to everyone. But it is not the case that everything that has been called a right in any society in the world is a universal human right. And that is why the framers of the Universal Declaration, who were practical people and wanted to get the approval, uh, which they did, unanimous approval with some abstainers, from 58 nations in 1948, that is why they deliberately stuck to a small core of fundamental principles that had support in most of the world's great religious and philosophical traditions. Today, however, efforts to expand the category of human rights continue apace. And that process not only undermines the claim for universality, but it also 
multiplies the occasions for clashes of rights. So to make matters worse, today's activists followed the selective approach initiated by the US and the Soviet Union way back when in promoting new rights they frequently ignore or even attack the established rights in the Universal Declaration relating to the family, parental rights, and religious freedom. In their hands, a document that was constructed as a unified document has be been deconstructed beyond recognition. That's my artwork there. Uh, <laughs> my, my daughter has much better slides, but I made that one myself. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> in developing countries, the activities of some Western-funded rights groups are seen as a sort of neo-colonialism or cultural imperialism, an attempt to universalize a particular set of Western values. Now that kind of charge has been made from the beginning by some of the world's worst human rights violators. But when it is made by people who are sympathetic to human rights, people like Calcutta-born Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winning economist, then they have to be taken seriously. On the eve of the Cairo Population Conference, Amartya Sen charged international policymakers with giving priority to their own ideas and exhibiting, quote, a dangerous tendency to treat people in poor countries not as reasonable beings, but as impulsive and uncontrolled sources of great social harm in need of strong discipline. Another factor fueling skepticism about international human rights has been the performance of international bodies charged with responsibilities for protecting human rights. Bodies like the UN Human Rights Council, which was established in 2006, and the International Criminal Court, which opened its doors in 2003. The credibility of those institutions has been damaged by evidence of bias and susceptibility to political pressure. And by the fact that international justice has often made it harder, sometimes necessary, but sometimes made it harder to resolve local conflicts, especially uh, in situations where a dictator is being removed where it's necessary in post-conflict situations to reconcile warring groups in fragile states, uh, ham-handed activity by distant international actors has not always been successful. And in the liberal democracies, the bloom is fading from the rose as well. Just as international interventions can undermine local institutions in developing countries, the proliferation of rights in countries with judicial review can weaken normal democratic political processes. Looking at complicated issues like immigration through the lens of rights impedes compromise and makes it harder to find workable solutions. And the winner-take-all aspect of courts ba court battles fosters divisiveness by making the losers in those battles feel angry and marginalized. And all of this risks undermining one of the West's most important and most precarious achievements. And that is the maintenance of societies where people and groups with a great variety of backgrounds and belief systems can live together in relative harmony. It has to be said, I think, that all of those concerns I mentioned need to be taken seriously. It's hard to avoid the conclusion that by trying to do too much, the Human Rights Project undermined its own credibility and failed to do the good that was possible. When you add the fact that rights or ideas about rights migrate more easily than the institutions and cultural supports that are needed to make rights effective, you have the makings of a full-blown legitimacy crisis. Which brings me to the question in my title, can the Human Rights Project be saved? It's my belief that the current challenges, though formidable, 
are not insuperable. It's striking to me that 70 years ago, Eleanor Roosevelt and her colleagues who drafted the UDHR foresaw nearly every one of the problems I have just mentioned. It's of interest, therefore, to inquire what, if anything, can be learned from their attempt to protect the document they constructed from the inevitable pitfalls that it would encounter. And I would suggest there are four major lessons to be drawn from the wisdom of those people. First, the number of principles that people from vastly different cultures can recognize as universal is relatively modest. Second, universality of human rights does not mean homogeneity in their implementation homogeneity in the way of bringing them to life. I think Catholics intuitively grasp that point, which is not hard, it's not easy for many people to understand, but uh, we are accustomed to thinking of a relatively small elements of a common faith that are enculturated, brought to life differently in different contexts. As Jacques Maritain once put it, different kinds of music can be played on the same keyboard. third lesson to be drawn from the work of the framers is that in resolving tensions or conflicts among fundamental rights, no fundamental right should be completely ignored. The search should be for ways to harmonize fundamental rights so that the maximum play can be given to each one, but never reading one entirely out of the canon. You may not be aware that there are actually, uh, there's a little legal literature growing up uh, in which uh, several law professors have claimed that uh, we don't need the religious freedom language in the First Amendment anymore, that that's a redundant right and everything that is necessary is covered by freedom of expression, speech, assembly. That's a very dangerous idea and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, the, um, the uh, framers of the Declaration wanted to make it clear that no fundamental right should be ignored, and that's why they put in Article 29, all rights must be exercised with due respect for the rights of others. They took great care to see that the document would be read as an integrated document, not, not a list like most bills of rights, but a set of mutually conditioning provisions. And that was no accident that this document actually has a structure. The, the drafting of it was entrusted to a French jurist named René Cassin, and uh, he was skilled in an art that, believe it or not, is not taught in American law schools. Legislative drafting, not taught in the law schools, not practiced in the legislatures. But René Cassin liked to explain the design of the Universal Declaration by comparing it to a portico, the portico of a temple. And as you can see, the rights in the Declaration, they are grouped in four pillars. The first pillar contains rights to be protected from the most egregious violations of personal security, torture, enslavement, degrading publish, uh, punishment, um, retroactive penal measures. These articles are so tightly drafted that there's little scope for variation at national and local levels. But most of the rights, not all, but most of the rights in the second and third pillars are more loosely drafted and leave a good deal of room for local variation and enculturation. And the rights, with one exception, Article 18, a special exception, religious freedom, which is very detailed and very capacious. And I will come back to that. Uh, in the fourth column, you have the economic, social, and cultural rights. And they are introduced by a mini preamble. This document contains its own uh, interpretive guides. As those of you who know the German Civil Code, it follows that, that model rather than the French model. Um, the, um, they, um, 
the, they are introduced, those last rites, by a little preamble that says um, they are to be implemented in accordance with the political structure of the state and the resources of the state. In other words, uh, the Soviet Union would <coughs> emphasize the state in implementation and the United States would emphasize combination of public and private measures. Um, now this brings me to the fourth lesson uh, that I think we can draw from the Declaration's framers. Today, many human rights supporters think of implementation primarily in terms of international law and international institutions. That's very distant from the view of the framers. They aimed at, they, they were ambitious in their way, modest in scope, but their ambition was nothing less than the transformation of culture. They made that clear in their preamble and in their proclamation. And Eleanor Roosevelt put it very well in one of her last speeches at the United Nations where she said, where after all do human rights begin? in small places, close to home, so close and so small, they cannot be seen on any maps of the world, and yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Unless those rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. Today, the approach of the framers to implementation would be described as the principle of subsidiarity, which, as I'm sure you know, emphasizes the primacy of the lowest level of decision making that can do the job, reserving national or international actors for situations where smaller entities are incapable of addressing the issues adequately. The virtue of that principle, as Paolo Carrozza has pointed out, is that it can, quote, value the freedom and integrity of local cultures without reducing particularism to pure devolution. And it can affirm internationalism without the temptation for a superstate or other centralized global authority, end quote. Now, I do not claim, I would not claim that the four principles I have just mentioned, the four lessons I have just mentioned, would save the human rights project. But it does seem to me that friends of human rights would do well to consider four steps corresponding to those principles. By accepting that the claim to universality is strengthened by sticking to basics, it would help them to stem the problems caused by proliferation of rights, and it would promote possibly the discovery of workable political solutions to complex problems. Second, by accepting a pluralistic approach to implementation, they might alleviate concerns about cultural imperialism and promote the kind of experiments that would benefit everyone. Third, by retrieving the understanding that the principles of the Declaration were meant to work together rather than be pitted against one another, they might contribute to better management of the tensions and conflicts among rights. And finally, fourth, by following the principle of subsidiarity, the international human rights movement could focus on the areas where it achieved its historic successes and where great need still exists the areas covered by the Declaration's tightly drafted protections against such grave violations of human dignity as torture, slavery, the forceful protection, and the, its forceful protection of religious liberty. Now, I would like to say just a few words about why I think the Human Rights Project is worth saving and not to be put in the category of witches and unicorns. With the passage of time, it's easy to forget what the post-World War II Human Rights Project did accomplish. One could quibble about using the terminology of rights, and I might be closer to Professor McIntyre on that than you might think, but 
this declaration was a way of um, concretizing the Allied war rhetoric. The, the, all the talk about what are we fighting for? Freedom, as FDR famously put it, uh, freedom for speech and belief, freedom from fear and want. And this project transformed, we shouldn't forget it, transformed the moral terrain of international relations by establishing that how a nation treats its own citizens is no longer that nation's business and nobody else's. That was a huge thing. Um, <laughs> over the years, it inspired movements that brought hope and freedom to many people. Even today, hardly any flagrant or repeated instance of rights abuse now escapes publicity, and most governments, most, now go to great lengths to avoid being blacklisted as notorious violators. Even today, the Universal Declaration remains the principal reference point for cross-cultural discussions of human freedom and dignity. So I'm tempted to say of the Universal Declaration what Abraham Lincoln once said about the Declaration of Independence. It, has, it is a stumbling block to tyrants and ever will be unless it is brought into contempt by its pretended friends. It's also worth remembering that the men and women who brought the Human Rights Project to life were not starry-eyed idealists. Nearly all of them had lived through two world wars, severe economic crises. The events of their times had showed them human beings at their worst, but also at their best. They took encouragement from the fact that while human beings are capable of gross violations of human rights, they were also capable of imagining that rights are there they were, capable of, they were capable of putting those rights in declarations, constitutions, bills of rights. They were capable of orienting their conduct toward them and feeling the need to make excuses when their conduct falls short. Today, Friends of Human Rights, and there are still many, are in the process of building on the legacy of those men and women who not without reason are sometimes called the greatest generation. And as to that task, I would like to leave you with one thought. As Eleanor Roosevelt and the other framers of the Declaration recognized, abstract ideals on a sheet of paper are dependent for the fullness of their content and for their coherence on the norms and values of human communities and institutions and cultural systems. And it's here, it seems to me, that Christianity and other religions have a vital role to play. And it is here, I believe, that current attempts to ignore the role of religion or even to eliminate religious freedom from the catalog of human rights are so dangerous. Thank you. Now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professoressa Patrizia Giunti from the University of Florence. She's a full professor of Roman law at the university. She's the dean of the Department of Legal Sciences and a member of the Academic, academic Senate, Senate excuse me, in the University of Florence. She earned her PhD from the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and was a researcher of Roman law in the University of Urbino. Her main research interests in the last few years covered the conditions of legal subjectivity, family relationships, and the institution of marriage to include issues linked to the natural obligations and to several respects of the abuse of that right. The title of her paper is The Complexity of Power Relations in the Ancient Roman Family Law. Professoressa, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. I'm deeply honored to stay here. And my special thanks to Carter for inviting me. It's a gift that I won't forget. 
and for this opportunity to speak about Roman law in a conference which title is inspired by Romans 13. It's a challenge. I must apologize, I'll read a text trying to stay on time. The first goal that I set for myself is to provide a representation of the power system of the Roman family, trying to understand the relationship between this family power system and the central power, the power of the state. In view of this aim, my intention is to make the voice of the ancients heard as much as possible, as it's too often repressed by the modern interpretation. The voice of the past offers extraordinary evidence, provided that there is a willingness to listen. The starting point of this reflection on the ancient family is an element which is certainly found in historiography, not only juridically, and it is an element which is well known to all, the connotation in the political sense of the family. The family is represented as the basic unit of social and political organization, the community which was originally responsible for order and defense, and which was later taken on by the state. This representation that can look linked to the 19th century evolutionary thinking has roots more, much more distant that take us back to the development of classical philosophy. In the words of Cicero, we can read, for it is by nature common to living beings, the instinct for reproduction, the first form of society lies in the marriage, the second in the bond with children, and this is the foundation of the public government, the nursery seminarium, the nursery of the state. This passage is taken from Cicero's The Offices. I heard Leeds talking about this yesterday afternoon, and it's back. Amongst Cicero's literary production, The Offices is a work with a special significance. It is the last philosophical work written a year before Cicero's death and dedicated to his son, Marco, and not being composed in a dialogue form, it is a true spiritual testament for the young Mar Marco, the legacy of an ethical model for the man management of life, both public and private. In this context, the reference to the law of nature, jus naturale, clearly takes on an absolutely fundamental significance. The family, the union of a couple aimed at procreation naturally occupies a logical and chronological position of priority because it is the basic model of the political organization of the city-state and the source of its continuity over time thanks to the, thanks to the succession of generations. Being burdened with this extraordinary political responsibility as a factor of order and stability, the family was therefore a political community. As such, the family was inevitably a center of power. The center of power was represented by the head of the family, the pater familias, the father, the male subject which has no alive ancestors and therefore represents the summit of the kinship. In the representation of uh, the figure of the paterfamilias and his power, even if we can find a significant evolution over time, we can easily verify the permanence of a strong political connect connotation, which again reaffirms the connotation of the political sense of the family. Again, Cicero, but now in uh, De Senectute, described the figure of the censor Appius Claudius, who, regardless of being old and blind, still held full control over his nine children, five males and four females, exerting on them not only auctoritas, it means a general authority, 
but also imperium. And uh, imperium in the Roman constitutional vocabulary is the power of civil and military command exercised by the supreme magistrate, the consul. A century later, Seneca will be able to say that fathers are domestic magistrates under whose care children are guided and therefore educated. The shift from the power of command to the function of address and custody is significant. And certainly Stoicism has contributed in this sense. But also in Seneca's view, the fathers are identified with the constitutional qualification magistratus that identifies the holders of the power of government, the holders of political sovereignty. Let us pass from literary quotations to legal quotations. Olpian. The role of the father is precisely identified to the ownership of power. According to the testimony of one of the greatest jurists of the imperial age, Ulpian, the father is the one who has the dominium, therefore the one who has the full supremacy, full control over the family group. All family members are under him. Within this full supremacy, this full control, the point upon which I want to click, focus on is the meaning and the role of the patria potestas as a power exercised over children. I will formulate some question which I will try to answer, as I said, by having the ancients speak. First question, what was the significance of patria potestas in Rome? It's a frequent recurring statement in doctrine that the patria potestas represented the backbone of the entire Roman private law system. But in my opinion, the patria potestas is even more than that. It is a real identifying feature of the Roman legal experience in the sense that thanks to the patria potestas, the Roman system measures its distance from the others. Let's consider the words of Gaius, a jurist from the second century AD. In describing the patria potestas, Gaius does not just say that patria potestas is the very law of Roman citizens, ius proprium civium Romanorum. He reinforces his statement with an explanation of comparative law. No other man have such authority over their children as we have. I know the Galatians hold they have, but it's not true. It's not the same thing. This explanation is absolutely important for the context in which it's formulated. The quotation is taken from the work of Gaius entitled Institutiones, Institutions which was the teacher's manual of law for first level student. It means that the first notion that students learned was that the specificity of the Roman legal system, if compared to other legal systems, arises from the patria potestas. The second question follows accordingly. What is the function of the patria potestas, where is its exceptionalism? Why it's so exceptional? One word can answer this question. The patria potestas is an absolute power, both vertically and horizontally. Vertically, the power of the father has no limits of time or of generations. It lasts as long as the father stays alive and extends not only to children, but also to children's children and so on. A long-living father 
and we have seen Appius Claudius, old and blind, but still there, could have four generations of descendants under his power. Of course, it's a patriarchal model of family. In this sense, the power of the father is what identifies the family and defines its boundaries. These are the words of Ulpian again. Strictly speaking, we call family the whole group of several persons who are subjected to the power of one person, either by nature or by law. Natura aut iure. Once again, we have the same reference to nature we have already seen in Cicero. And this confirms to us that family comes from procreation within a marriage. However, Ulpian's testimony tells us that a family can also be created iure from a legal technique. And here, the reference is clearly to the institution of the adoption, which was practiced in Roman from remote antiquity. Yet, in any case, whether the result of a birth or an adoption, it is the subjection to the power of the father that creates the members of each family without any generational limitation. On the other hand, patria potestas is an absolute power also horizontally. This means that the patria potestas comprehends all faculties of private law and gives the father all legal capacity. Regardless of the number of members, the Roman family has only one center of imputation of legal subjectivity, the father. From this same perspective, the father also holds full power over the person of his children, power that can extend even to the right to life or that, which is undoubtedly the most problematic part of patria potestas. It is Pepinian, another famous jurist who lived in the second century AD, who informs us about the antiquity of this power. As since a law of the king has given the father the right to the life and death over his child. Other sources state that Romulus himself gave the fathers this power. Is there a kind of uh, legislative delegation from public sovereignty to private sovereignty? But of course, first of all, we could ask ourselves whether this information is true. But did Romulus really exist? Could the figure of Romulus rather constitute a foundation myth? The issue is absolutely crucial, but for our purpose, in my opinion, it's irrelevant. I mean, if our goal is the history of law, and law is a cultural product, and thus our goal is the history of legal culture, what is essential for us is to understand how the Romans themselves interpreted their legal system and how they described their legal history. It's not important for us to verify whether our founder called Romulus really existed and whether he was the first of the kings that Rome surely had before the passage from monarchy to republic. It is important to verify what role Romulus had in the way the Romans themselves wrote their legal history. Thus, the words of Papinian show us that within the Roman legal thought, the right to life and death was born with the foundation of the city and intersected the origin of that political legal project known as city, polis in the Greek word. 
So, the fundamental role of Pace Potestas finds now its best confirmation. And so, that's why the Father's right to life and death gives us the best opportunity to question ourselves about the ways of interaction between private sphere and public sphere, between family and state. The power granted to Padre Familias by a royal law for which there was no procedural control, no legal responsibility, made the power of the father prevailing over that of the city out of all limits, isn't it? This was not the case. And not only because a jurist like Papinian, not an historian or a poet, but a legal technician, certifies that the Padre Familias thanks to the affection that binds to the name of the father, Pietas Paterni Nominis, had a low propensity to kill. And in fact, there are a few cases of killing documented by sources. The point is that even when the right to kill is exercised, it does not appear to us exercised in a self-referential mode and therefore unmotivated. On the contrary, it seems to respond to precise logic, to precise values. Two cases very famous can be remembered. The, six, the 63 BC is uh, the year of the famous conspiracy of Catilina, a ruthless politician at the head of a conspiracy against the Senate and the Republican government. Cicero, who was consul in that year, discovered the conspiracy and publicly denounced Catilina in the Senate. It was a declaration of war from the Senate against Catilina. The army was deployed, Catilina gathered his followers, and it ended with the final battle in which Catilina himself was killed. Valerius Maximus, an historian, an historian of the first imperial age, tells us that a senator, Aulus Fulvius, having learned that his son was one of the conspirators, chased him personally while he was running to the camp of Catilina and killed his son. But the testimony does not end there. Since the writer, Valerius Maximus, warns the, need, warns the need to have the father say the words with which he justified the killing, I generated the son for the country against Catilina and not for Catilina against the country. It is for this reason the security of the state, that the ancient source can justify the power of the father to kill. The private power of the father to kill is therefore framed in a very high perspective of values to guarantee the security of the state, the safeness of the republican government against a conspiracy and a military attack. Four centuries earlier, in 451 BC, a particularly painful event had occurred. The protagonist was Claudius, the head of the commission of 10 men that the year before had been set up to write a code of laws after the suspension of all ordinary constitutional offices. Claudius, taking advantage of his extraordinary position of power, instituted a fake trial with false witness that were corrupted by him against a young and beautiful plebeian woman, Virginia, who did not want to give in to his courtship. The trial was intended to show that Virginia was a slave of Claudius from whom she had been taken. Virginia must therefore be returned to Claudius as property. At the culmination of the trial, the girl's father, Virginius, 
uses the dagger and kills his daughter. And here we have Livius. Also this time, a statement accompanies the moment of the killing. Virginius says, daughter, in this way, the only way I can, I keep you free forever. In this case too, the private power of the father to kill is framed in a very high perspective of values to guarantee the dignity of the free person. And this perspective of a private nature evolves in a political perspective because from the killing of Virginia, a popular movement was born that led to the expulsion of Claudius from Rome. This is a very famous painting and uh, you, can, uh, you can see uh, the red color of the coat, a uh, symbol of tyranny, and the blood dagger that uh, Virginius uh, shows, uh, and the crowd around, uh, the symbol of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the moment uh, of revolt uh, that uh, is about to start. From, uh, the, the, the painting is, uh, comes from uh, the Museum of Capodimonte in, in, in Naples, as you can see. From these cases, we have the evidence that the moral and juridical problem of the function of the father, <coughs> of the father familias, was present in the Roman legal system. Instead of a manifestation of bloodthirst and masterly arrogance, the right to life and death appears to us as the expression of a power exercised for the implementation of higher values of the city, of the state, or of the individual. Just considering this reference to a system of values, we can appreciate the role of the father and the role of his fundamental power in its interaction with public sovereignty. But we can understand the full meaning of this constant integration between family and state, between power of the father and political power, only if we fully understand the condition of the son, the filius familias, the son under his father's power. As we have seen, the Roman citizen was part of two dimensions of power. As a citizen in a relationship to the city, to the Republica, as part of a family in a relationship to the father familias, to the father. It means that the position of a son is given by the convergence of two situations. His legal incapacity within the domestic sphere and, on the other hand, the bundle of rights that defines him as a citizen and allows him to manage a magistratal church. A son can apply and be elected. In other words, a 40 years old Roman citizen with a living father and thus under the family power system had no personal or property right and was instead subject to the power of his father. Yet, this subjection did not prevent him from enjoying civil and political rights. A son subject to patria potestas would have been able to run for public office, even at the highest level in the cursus honorum, the consulate, and be elected consul as long as he was 43 years old. The question obviously is, how much can the family power project itself forward, actually entering into conflict with the sphere of political power occupied by the son? This is the same as asking, how would a possible conflict between private and public powers have been resolved? Which power would have been the higher? When a son is elected a magistrate and faced with the many problematic situations that can arise, we see that the jurists intervene to protect, to lock the position of the son elected magistrate, ensuring the fullness of the functions connected to the role and the impartiality 
of the government action. Here we can find Paul, another famous jurist who lived in the same period, who states that in front of a magistrate who is a, so, who is a son, the legal acts of competence, the reference here is it manumissio, the legal acts of competence are regularly carried out even if the interest involved is that of the father. Again, Ulpian states that the filius, the son, who is a magistrate, a praetor in this case, can even order his father to perform the necessary acts in case of a suspicious inheritance. This is a special technical case, I don't care. But of course, the important thing is the order. A son who orders his father, is it a paradox? There is a general principle that we find formulated by a jurist who lived a century before Ulpian and Paul. He was Pomponius. In this quotation, Pomponius says that in matters of public relevance, the son that runs a magistracy is considered as a father. What does this inversion of roles mean? This reversal of roles mean? The jurists of the first imperial age identify a higher value, the good performance of the public administration, the correct exercise of public functions, and according to this, they mark precise boundaries to the power of the father outside the domestic sphere. What conclusion can be drawn from this consideration? From these considerations, a good message. Complexity wasn't born with us. <laughs> the Roman legal experience is based on the construction of a hierarchy between private power and public power. A hierarchy that is, however, the expression of a set of values, the efficiency of administrative action, the security of the state, the defense of the dignity of every person, the rejection of tyranny, and the, safene and the safeness of the republican government. And therefore, this hierarchy does not appear to us to be stiffened in a predetermined system. This hierarchy of powers appears to us mobile, reciprocal, capable of being inverted, and therefore capable of representing a complexity of higher powers tied to the realization of the values profiles represented from time to time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank both Professor Glendon and uh, Professor Sajunti for their magnificent reflections on the relationship between higher powers and man, the project of human rights, and again, the reflections in Roman law and the pater familias and the pat uh, patria potestas. So if anyone has any questions, please use the microphones and uh, given that we have some time, I would invite you, uh, caution you, if I might, to ask questions and not make statements, if at all possible. So they should end in a question mark and they should be brief and concise. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Nicholas Del Rosal from Christendom College. So I have a question for uh, Professor Sajunti. How did the rise of Christianity affect, and the legalization of Christianity affect the paterfamilias, especially concerning interfaith marriages, uh, when you would have a mix of Christian and pagans in the same family household? Or did it not affect it at all? 
Um, thank you for your question, of course. Um, if I'm not wrong, you asked uh, which is the influence uh, of the Christianity. Am, am I correct? Yes. <sighs> How long is the conference? <laughs> uh, believe me, of course, uh, there is an important um, period, uh, this is a period when uh, the Roman legal <laughs> tradition uh, meets the Christianity and the message of the new faith. And uh, of course it's not possible, believe me, uh, to, to say everything, uh, but uh, I just try to give the idea of this reciprocal influence. Uh, because uh, surely uh, the Roman laws was influenced by the message of faith. And uh, we can find uh, that uh, after the Emperor Constantine, uh, the, rights, uh, the right to life and death was abolished. Uh, and uh, this is the first moment we can see that a new time was born. But on the other hand, and for many other aspects, uh, we can uh, see that uh, the message of Christianity, the, the new faith, uh, received uh, the influence uh, of the Roman legal categories. I think that, uh, of course, I didn't say, and uh, it's just a topic that we, talk, we could talk about for hours, but I think that the same uh, presentation that uh, Paul in Romans 13 uh, does of these um, higher powers uh, that can interact each other with different uh, um, qualifications uh, and different contexts, uh, respect uh, and law and, uh, and, and, and the fees and, uh, and tax and uh, others um, is a, a consequence uh, partly of uh, this influence of uh, the Roman law. Um, the context is reciprocal. Um, Paul was a citizen, and he was perfectly aware of his citizenship and the rights of his citizenship. And when he says, civis sum, I am a citizen, he is claiming and uh, he's uh, affirming his right to receive a due process and not be killed by the policeman. In that moment, uh, the, the, the page of uh, Lucas is, is wonderful. In that moment, uh, we see that uh, Paul uh, is uh, affirming his rights as a Roman citizen. And in fact, uh, he will be sent to Rome and he will have uh, a due process and he is sentenced to death in any case, of course, but he couldn't be put to death immediately just by a policeman. So um, the influence uh, is uh, sure, and uh, as I've said you, uh, the most important uh, uh, moment is with uh, the Emperor Constantine, when he abolished the rights uh, to, uh, of the father to, to put his, uh, his son uh, to death. But uh, the influence is, uh, on the other hand, uh, from the Roman law to the Christianity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luke Foster from the University of uh, Chicago and a question for uh, Professor Glendon about the history and future of, of human rights. As you mentioned, um, many times earlier in the 20th century, especially during the Cold War, actions by the UN in the name of human rights against national sovereignties, like the, the Suez Crisis intervention or the Congo Crisis in 62, were with Soviet and American agreement against smaller countries generally. Um, and yet now, of course, we see the US itself increasingly skeptical about its place in the human rights order, withdrawing from the Human Rights Commission. So what do you think has happened with this inversion of sovereignty concerns from the small countries to the big countries? And is that a lasting change or is that just this administration and something that can be reversed? Well, it's impossible to say what uh, will happen in the future in US foreign policy, but uh, I do think that we are in a moment really uh, a, a unique moment in the history of post-World War II human rights mm -hmm. where the skepticism, the, the waning of support for the human rights idea is as strong as it has ever been. There was skepticism in 1948, uh, considerable skepticism. 
but uh, by very careful attention to achieving consensus, a document was approved without a dissenting vote. Eight abstentions, that already signaled uh, trouble down the line. Uh, I, I think that we are at really, at, at the, the word that is used in this new literature is we're, we're at a crisis uh, for the very idea of human rights. And I think that's regrettable. Hi, my name is Judah Maxwell. I'm a law student here at Notre Dame. My question is to Mrs. Glendon. And uh, the late Samuel Huntington noted that the universal rights language came really out of the Western liberal tradition and that uh, it, it presupposed many of its assumptions. However, really when you have these absolute human rights, oftentimes they come into conflict with each other such as in the Islamic world, the freedom of religion versus the freedom of speech, or here debates about abortion or immigration are often both sides framed in rights-based hierarchies. My, my question is, is that when these, these rights come into combat with each other, when they conflict and they are hierarchically arranged, they seem to always be hierarchically arranged on a presupposed telos of the religion of that society, or the philosophy of that society. And so, how can there be a universal human rights if there's no universal telos to arrange them? Yeah, that's a, a good question, and it's one that has haunted the human rights project from the beginning. Um, and the, in 1946, uh, the UN consulted a group of philosophers and theologians from all over the world, east and west, north and south. And it was clear from the beginning that there was not going to be any consensus on a common foundation for human rights. And uh, that has been one of the great criticisms of the whole project, that it's built on sand. The UN was aware of that, by the way. In, in the very charter of the UN, 1945, it's so interesting that uh, in the charter of the UN, at the beginning, it says uh, this uh, the organization is founded on, among other things, faith in human rights. Um, so uh, it's a chronic problem, uh, the lack of a common foundation. But that does not mean that there was no foundation, because what the philosophers group found was that although these principles were articulated as rights in the West, uh, you could find analogous principles not designated as rights in most, I have to say, most of the world's religious and philosophical traditions, because obviously, if nihilism is a tradition, it <laughs> isn't going to provide a foundation. But uh, Maritain and the others, re and my old philosophy professor, Richard McKeon at the University of Chicago, they reported to the diplomats on Mrs. Roosevelt's committee that there was enough to go forward, for the project to go forward. So uh, Michael Novak likes to, used to like to speak of the foundations as um, the Universal Declaration with its very small core of principles is like a stool that rests on a number of legs. But it does, now, um, conflicts and hierarchies, uh, you know, showed you that diagram of the portico. The way that Kassan and the other drafters imagined the declaration was that these principles were mutually reinforcing. And uh, of course, that was just blasted uh, by the Soviet Union and the United States. And that understanding has not really been recovered internationally. But you can see how it could work in the jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court, which uh, has a uh, a method of dealing with clashes of rights that they call practice concordance, practical harmonization, where uh, their approach is that no fundamental right can be read out of the canon, uh, and each has to be given as much play and force as it can, while 
keeping it in relation to the other. So, you know, these, these internal tensions that don't go away, freedom and equality, uh, many. Now, some of the things you mentioned have never been recognized as universal rights. Uh, for abortion, for example. And uh, some of the things that you mentioned uh, are simply uh, nations that signed on to Article 18 with such provisions as no one has, uh, no one can be prevented from changing his religion. Uh, some of the nations in the world are simply ignoring that, and uh, that's one of the things that the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom focuses on perennially. For Professor Glendon, um, maybe it's because I was spending some time last night preparing um, Pachman Harris by uh, John the 23rd for students uh, that I'm thinking about rights in this case. And I'm very struck in that document by how much uh, the Pope stresses the notion of yes, rights, but duties as well, to the point where he actually says those who insist on their rights uh, without paying attention to their duties build with one hand and tear down with another. Uh, do you think that stressing the uh, concomitant idea of duty along with right uh, is worth resurrecting to um, restore confidence in the Human Rights Project, or are we simply too far gone that that argument can't even be reasonably raised anymore? Well, it's right there in the Universal Declaration. And of course, uh, I'm glad you mentioned John the 23rd. Uh, he was an important figure in the lobbying that went on in Paris in 1948. He very quietly, behind the scenes, uh, worked the corridors to uh, bring uh, about that amazing unanimity. Uh, so um, when in the drafting process, uh, representatives of Eastern nations, particularly the Chinese representative, nationalist China, uh, PC Chang, uh, they said uh, we really should have duties right up there instead of at the end where it is. And what, uh, in the portico diagram, the pediment is the last few articles and that's where the duties are. And Chang said, rights and duties, the correlation between the two should be right up front in the beginning. And Cassin, who was the stylist, said, well, uh, that's awkward because we're saying everyone has the right, right, right. I mean, it's just, it's a decision that one might regret, except for the fact that those concluding articles, the three concluding articles, are interpretive guides to the whole thing. Should we resurrect it? Yes, I think so. When you think about the uh, social and economic rights, which uh, cause uh, so much, um, skepticism on the part of many people. Um, those rights, and in some European constitutions, those concepts are not framed as rights. They're framed as duties that a decent polity owes to its citizens in need. And uh, somehow, you know, for instance, Norway would be a place that has that in its constitution. Somehow it might you might feel better about <laughs> uh, a duty to help out your neighbor than uh, your neighbor's got the right, I mean, it, it's a psychological, but it may have some it's a, weight. It's a, a, absolutely. So yes, I, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea at all to start reading uh, the Universal Declaration, not as a list, but as a unified document. It's not very big. I mean, it fits on one sheet of paper that you saw my uh, artistic. Oh, I don't have it with me, but it fits on one sheet of paper. And uh, it's, it's, if you read it with the idea of a structure in mind, you find a lot of interesting things. For example, a word that appears over and over again in it is dignity, uh, to the point where you could almost say, I have to say almost, that dignity is the hermeneutical key to the document. I have to say almost because in the current chaos, dignity has been hijacked along with everything else. But you don't give up on those words. Take those words back. 
Hi, Ryan Farrell, Christendom College. My question is directed towards Professor Glendon, and it's somewhat related to the last question. Um, it involves the previous framing of limitations in civil society as duties, um, authority, and jurisdiction rather than rights. Specifically, I think as long as we maintained that way of framing this question, we maintained more of a focus on the primacy of the common good uh, and the end of civil society as the order of the whole. So in light of that, does it not seem to be the case that not only is rights language not particularly useful in solving many of our practical problems, especially insofar as many countries don't accept the rights language to begin with, but it is also not the case that framing it in such a way is somewhat dangerous to our conception of politics as a whole and makes it excessively personalistic? Well, this is one of the criticisms of rights language that is most often made. That's the criticism of uh, Rusty Reno and First Things. And uh, I would agree with it to this extent that uh, you can overdo a good thing by uh, rights language, whatever, you know, we lawyers, we're, we're only a second order discipline at best, but uh, for us, uh, you know, if something seems to work and, uh, and uh, foster the common good, uh, we're not too ready to throw it away. But uh, I do understand the philosophical objections to rights language, but uh, my thought would be uh, keep it for special occasions. Don't make everything in the whole world, every conceivable interest or claim, a universal right. And that will promote the solving of problems through ordinary democratic political processes and finding workable solutions. There's an overuse of the rights concept, especially in some national courts and it shuts down politics. Not a good thing. Michał Czewski from the Center for the Thought of John Paul II uh, from Warsaw. Uh, building on that last question, I have a question, why then proliferation of human rights? Uh, if uh, everybody why sees- Why then what? Proliferation of human rights. Ah. Why, why that process? If everybody sees that this is a bad process, why is that? And maybe this is because there's also a source of that proliferation in the uh, Act of Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, well, I, I think one reason is uh, the, the idea was a victim of its own success when uh, it started to show what could be accomplished uh, in South Africa, in Eastern Europe. Then uh, it just attracted uh, a number of groups with agendas that they thought would be um, good to have proclaimed. Right now you've got, uh, somebody counted a thousand proposals for new rights, uh, access to the internet, free employment counseling, I mean, you could go on and on. Uh, and uh, another move that sometimes happens if, uh, if you have a particular interest that you would like to have protected as a right in your own country, if you could go to the UN and somehow uh, make the case that it should be an international right, then you bring it back to your own country. And say, it's like Edmund Burke in his Reflections on the French Revolution talks about uh, how you, uh, you can take a concept from England and bring it over to France and uh, claim that it has an English heritage and then he says counterfeit wear is coming back to England again from the French Revolution, very dangerous. Um, so uh, I, I think the human rights project, if it is going to survive, is going to have to concentrate on keeping the list of rights that have a claim to be universal, on keeping that list uh, limited to rights that have that are deeply rooted in most of the world's philosophical and religious traditions. Um, hi, I'm Clara Minieri. I'm an Argentine attorney. I did my LLM here. Um, thank you both for your presentations. I have a question for Professor Glendon. Um, just this week, the Human Rights Committee of the UN issued the general comment on Article 6 of the International Covenant Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it's basically, they're basically saying that 
unbanned abortion and euthanasia are part of the right to life. So what are African and Latin American countries that are fighting to keep the ban on abortion and on euthanasia to do with the, this international pressure that's coming from the UN? Yes, well, as I mentioned, this is one of the problems that institutions that are charged with certain responsibilities for protecting human rights have been, they're very distant from accountability, from publicity, and uh, so they are susceptible to lobbying by all kinds of interest groups. And some of the most active interest groups in the UN settings are those that are promoting uh, rights related to abortion, human sexuality in general. Now, do you walk out? I mean, here's the question. I don't know the answer to it, but do you, do you walk out? Mm, I uh, think so. When, uh, when our uh, Holy See delegation went to the Beijing Women's Conference, UN Conference, and uh, there were many groups there that were lobbying hard for abortion rights, and uh, including the United States, and uh, we had a discussion within our delegation. Uh, do we walk out or do we stay and try to influence the document? And uh, it, the decision, we were divided on it. The decision went right to Pope John Paul II and it was reported back to me. I had to write two speeches. <laughs> I mean, this, I'm sitting there with two speeches. Uh, it's like being back in law school and arguing both sides of the case. Uh, and uh, it was reported back to me that the Pope said, uh, stay there, accept what you can, and what you can't accept, denounce clamorosamente. <laughs> Thank you. Which we did. <laughs> Hello, my name is Timothy Troutner. I'm from the University of Notre Dame. My question is also for Mary and Glendon, and it has to do with the narrative, which I've heard about the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And I'm just curious as to what you think about it, which is that, as you've said, it doesn't have as much of a unified theoretical foundation, and that what unifies it had, the, the, this narrative is that what has unified it had more to do with the memory of the two world wars. So basically the unifying power came from the f fear of making, of like having what had happened during those people's lifetimes happen again. And so what unified people in their conviction around rights was more of memory, uh, fear, and concern based on what they'd experienced in their lifetime rather than something theoretical. According to this narrative, it's natural that there's a sort of deterioration of this commitment as those people who do remember these times um, pass away. What do you think about that narrative which, se which seeks to root the decay less on the level of theory and just more on the decay of, on the decay of memory? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, one of the things that has brought us to this crisis in human rights is precisely a great deal of forgetfulness. And I, I, I mentioned four forgotten things that uh, perhaps could be helpful in the present situation. But your question about uh, whether it's all tied to a particular moment in time, I don't think so. I think if, if I were to say what, what was the most important thing that uh, we forget is that what this declaration and what this, I mean, it wasn't just the declaration, but the covenants that came later and the genocide convention, what, what all of that accomplished, it changed the moral terrain of international relations so that even today, how a nation treats its own citizens is no longer that nation's own business. And that's a very big thing. You don't, I don't think anybody, I, mean, I could talk to Professor McIntyre maybe, but I don't think anybody wants to get rid of that. So perhaps our last question as we wrap up for lunch. A question for Dr. Gianti. Um, I understood your lecture to, to be saying, and perhaps incorrectly, that the, 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 the power of the, the pater familias over his uh, progeny was uh, a participation in the form, as it were, of the patria potestas, of the, of the, of the overall power of the government. And uh, if I understood that correctly, I would ask, what would, what would uh, do you think that's how Vico would have seen it, or, would he, would have, or, or do you think there's a case that 
uh, it was the pre-existing power of the, the father over the children that led to the power uh, that was reflected in the power of the state over its citizens. There is no, there, the, the principle is that there is no, no principle, there is no order, um, because uh, um, the two spheres are uh, separated and connected, public power and private power. And uh, the father has its own, his own power inside the family and over his uh, children, uh, its children, but uh, mm, uh, he was in the, in the same time uh, each citizen was in the same time owner of his, of his capacity as a citizen. So mm, the, system, the system is absolutely um, complex. And uh, each one has his own uh, capacity as a citizen. I'm speaking just about male citizens, of course. In this case, uh, we have really to sign uh, deep discrimination because uh, the women uh, had no civil and political rights in Rome. So in this case, uh, not in the case uh, of <laughs> uh, Mrs. Clinton, but in this case, uh, uh, the rights uh, are uh, absolutely different from men and women. But women had the same capacity and private law as the men. They didn't have, they did not have uh, civil and political rights. So if we consider just the, the, males, the male situation, uh, we have mm, the uh, double capacity that is for all citizens, for all fili, for all sons and fathers in uh, the public sphere. And inside the family, just for the father over all his uh, descendants, not only the first, not only uh, the sons, but all the nephews and so on. And uh, of course, it's a, a patriarchal model of, uh, of, uh, of family. Uh, I don't know if, I'm, I, if I, uh, I comprehended your, uh, your question. Well, uh, you did. Thank you very much for your answer. Just, just out of respect of time, uh, we'll close the session. If there are any other questions, <clears throat> you can approach the panelists uh, separately. Again, I'd like to have you join me in thanking our two panelists.